Now, what an excellent chapter, John, chapter number eight. You can go on and on and on. There's all kinds of sermons here, and it's it's just so, it strikes me so much. You know, I'm just gonna make one brief comment about this, but I don't want to get sidetracked. I got a lot of content to go over with um, you know this whole oneness junk that's been going around online and people denying the Trinity and just trying to to throw them all into one. It's very evident through John chapter eight. John chapter eight is an awesome chapter, but you see, I mean, all throughout this, you have the Son and the Father. Just, just constantly being referred to as separate persons. Now, we know they're one God. Jesus said, you know, before Abraham was, I am. He is part of that Godhead. He's part of the I am. But he's also separate from the Father. So, you know, if, if I didn't, uh, he said, if, if I glory of myself, my glory is void. If I, if I bear witness of myself. And, and obviously, you need to have two. So, um, anyways, I, you can read through this again. John chapter 8, awesome chapter. But what I'm going to be preaching on this afternoon is uh, the, the doctrine, because we're going through a lot of fundamental doctrines, especially since this church is brand new. I want to make sure I hit a lot of the, the very, very important doctrines and the things that we believe here in this church. And one of the doctrines that this church holds to is that we're King James Bible only. We believe in a King James version of the Bible in the English language. And what that means, when I say we're only King James Bible believers, that we believe that God has preserved His Word in the English language, I'm not saying it's not in any other languages, we're not saying everyone has to learn English in order to understand the Word of God. But what we're saying is that English is a language that we speak. It's the language that people speak in this country. It's, it's, it's the language that most people speak in the world. And in that language, God has preserved His Word perfectly for us. He's preserved His Word perfectly throughout time. And we have access to that Word today. And it's found in the King James Version of the Bible. And we only use this because we believe that this is without error. This is inerrant. That there are no mistakes in here. We don't need to access or reference any other books that might call themselves a Holy Bible because they are actually full of errors. And this book is not. So this is what we use. This is the only book that we use. And we base our faith as Christians, and every Christian should be doing this, off of the Word of God, off of what God says. Man can be a liar. Man can teach different things. That's why we're not just, just sucked into some denominational or church structure in the sense that, oh, all, you know, half of our truth comes from church fathers and the other half comes from the Bible, like the Catholic Church teaches, that they have an authority that's that's mixed, right? They have authority. Yes, there's some authority in Scripture, but there's also an authority with the Pope and with God, you know, and they're able to pontificate and say things that are going to be accepted by the church as truth. We don't believe that. All of our source of faith, all the things that we believe in come strictly from the Scriptures. It strictly comes from the Bible. That is what we believe in, and that's what we're teaching. So what, there's a lot of ways. This is, this is a very in-depth subject. So if there is anyone here this morning, and maybe you're not settled on this topic, maybe you've heard about this before, maybe you haven't heard about this before. I don't know. But there's a lot of different ways to prove reasonably why we believe what we believe. Okay, why we believe the King James Bible is true. One, I'm only going to focus on one way this afternoon. And one way of determining what's right and what's wrong is going to be very simply by putting them side by side and doing a comparison. You can see that there are differences just when you take, let's say, well, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, did God even preserve His Word for us? Or are we just left guessing? Do we even know? Do, do we have access to God? You know, that, that's kind of a fundamental core belief to have before you even start looking at, well, which one is right? And one of the, the main passages that I get that from, there's, there's multiple, I'm not going to get too far into this, but in Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, the Bible reads, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the Bible itself says that it's God's job to preserve His own words from this generation, which is the generation all the way back when David was penning down the Psalms, when the, when, when the Word was literally given to him by inspiration and he spake the Word of God, from that generation even forever. 
that those words were going to be preserved, that God is responsible for that. Because look, if it's just solely, completely, 100% only left up to man, I could understand the argument that would say, well, man screws things up. That things are going to change over time because there's going to be errors and man doesn't do everything perfectly. But if God is the one preserving it, then how could there be error? Think about, think about a person being led to Christ. If it's just a man and God's not involved, how is that person ever going to be saved? If I just go out in my flesh and I, and I, and I try to, to instill faith in somebody and it's just me and there's no work of the Holy Ghost, there's no work of God involved at all, I'm going to come up empty every single time. Because the power and the salvation is not me. It's through God. Yet God uses human instruments. We're imperfect, but the, look at the great power that comes through God when He uses people. Just as much as God uses people to preach the gospel and for other people then to receive faith and get saved, He also has used man throughout history to preserve His Word. He's been involved in that, in that preservation, in the transcriptions, in the translations. It is completely possible, and that is actually what we firmly believe here, and that He has preserved it. Now, we started off here in John chapter 8, and the part of the chapter I want to focus in on is in John 8, 44. And because it's God's Word, we believe it is perfect. If there's errors, if it's not right, if there's contradictions, it's not from God. Because God doesn't contradict Himself. John 8, verse number 44, this is Jesus Christ, of course, speaking to the Jews that didn't believe on Him. And he says, look, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So he's saying the devil is the father of lies. He is a liar. There is no truth in him. And I believe that the modern Bible versions that we have in English, they are literally of the devil. It's not just it's a little sloppy or a little, they got a little, something a little bit wrong. I believe that they are lies, that, that the, God's Word is twisted and perverted enough. And I'm gonna, we're going to see evidence of it this afternoon. And actually, um, I brought, I forgot to get them out. Um, would you mind grabbing some of the, the, what? All of them? Oh, great. Thanks for setting them up for me. I didn't even see all this stuff here. I have, if you'd like to follow along, I think there's one more, the Gideon's Bible that's, that's in there. The Gideon's is the New King James. So does, does anyone want to follow along in one of these? Just raise your hand. I'll give one to you. Just, just check them out. Anyone? Anyone? Come on. It's fun. Here. <laughs> there's another one back there, too. It's the, the, the Gideon's Bible. It's a New King James Version. And we're going to look at different, different passages. And I want you to be able to see for yourself. And you know what? Maybe you didn't want to raise your hand now. But, but check out after the service. You could, you could see for yourself. There's a lot of passages I'm going to go through. So I'm not going to give you a lot of time to be, you know, checking every single one of these verses. I did all the verification. You could go to BibleGateway.com. They've got all the different Bible versions up there that you can look up and, and see for yourself. And you could actually put them side by side and you can see the differences all for yourself. It's all there. But um, so Jesus is saying here in John 8, 44, he says, you know, when he speaketh uh, of his own, he's a liar, the father of it. Verse number 45, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Now, a lot of people have this argument, and these are people who haven't studied it very much, but you're just repeating what someone else has told you. Oh, the differences aren't really that big of a deal, or they don't really affect doctrine, or um, it's just, you know, they're just getting rid of some of the archaic language and really hard to understand King James Bible language. You know, they're trying to make it easier for you. Well, first of all, and this isn't in my notes, but even in this chapter, Jesus himself said that... Uh, Verse number 43, he says, Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? And then he proceeds to tell them that they're of the devil. They can't understand what he's saying because they're not even saved. 
And I know for a fact that this is the way it was with me, and it's with that with most people. If you just simply cannot understand the King James Bible at all when you read it, you just have no understanding, you don't know what it's saying, the first thing you might want to check is, are you saved? Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And another, they're not going to follow. We, we, you could understand this. And I know for myself, I tried reading the Bible before I was saved. It, it, it was like literally like blinders over my eyes. I understood English. I was a good student. I, I understood grammar. But I just could not get the meaning whatsoever by reading the Bible. It wasn't until after I got saved. It was just all of a sudden, wow, this actually makes sense. Now, it doesn't mean every single thing that you read, you're going to have total, full comprehension knowledge. I know exactly what every verse means. No, but there's a big difference between not understanding any of it and getting to, to realize, oh, wow, I actually do get this now. Now that I'm saved, now that we have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us that can guide us into all truth and all wisdom. But Jesus questions them here in, in John 8, 46. He says, which of you convinceth me of sin? And this is a core doctrine. We believe that Jesus Christ was sinless, that he was perfect. And that's why he's saying, look, you know, they're all coming against Jesus. They hate Jesus. But he's like, which of you can convince me of sin? Which of you can prove that I'm a sinner? Nobody could because he's never done anything wrong. But you know what the, the modern Bible translations do? They do make Jesus Christ a sinner. And here's one example of that. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5, you could follow along in your King James Bible. Hopefully that's what you have today. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 22. <coughs> I mean, essentially, if I'm going to base everything I believe off of a book, I want to make sure I got the right book. Because that is what we're doing. We're believing God's Word. We're believing the Bible. And I'm, what I'm going to show you today, after this point, I'm going to show you direct contradictions where what the other versions say are exact opposite of what the King James Bible says. So at the very least... You cannot say, well, they're all the same thing, or you could just use any of them. You're going to have to be, you know, get to a point where you say, well, I need to determine what's right and what's wrong. Because you have one book that says one thing, and you have another one that says the exact opposite. They cannot both be true. You cannot accept them both. That's madness. So you at least need to figure out, well... Which one is more reliable? Which one should, you know, whatever it is, you're going to be forced to come to a decision on these events. Now, look at Matthew chapter 5. I said that these modern versions will make Jesus Christ a sinner. They convince Jesus of sin. Matthew 5.22, the Bible says, the Holy Bible says, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So what is he saying? The first part of the verse, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That's pretty serious. He said, wouldn't you say that that's probably a sin if he's saying you're in danger of the judgment if you're angry with your brother without a cause? It's a sin, right? Well, what do the modern translations say? I've got the New American Standard, I've got the ESV, and I've got the NIV because those are some of the most popular versions being used today or the most widely accepted outside of the King James Version. The New American Standard says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And I'm not going to read the whole verse because this is the part that matters. Now, notice what's missing there. Without a cause. Without a cause. So this is just saying, if you're just angry, then you're guilty. The ESV says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. The NIV says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So the key difference here is that the modern versions are just making being angry the sin and not being angry without a cause. So if you have no reason to be angry with someone, if it's not a valid reason to be angry with someone, then yes, that is a sin. But I'll tell you what, if you've got a very good reason to be angry with a brother, or with, you know, that's not a sin. If I catch a brother in Christ committing adultery with my wife, you better believe I'm going to be angry. Because it's going to make me mad. And you know what? That's going to be righteous anger. There's nothing sinful or wrong about that. But according to the modern translations, I guess I would be ready for judgment because I'm angry with a brother. 
And this is where they make Jesus a sinner. If you want to turn to Mark chapter 3. You may not believe this, but Jesus actually got angry in the Bible. And I would say he got angry with, bro with brethren as well. Not just angry at the lost, but I think angry with a brother. But there was always a cause for it. There was always a reason, which, according to King James Bible, makes it just fine. He's not a sinner. According to his other versions, that would make him a sinner. Mark 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Every one of those versions that I quoted earlier also say that Jesus looked on them with anger. So it's not like they say something different there. You know, they all say the same thing. It's funny how they all agree with the King James on that verse, but on the other ones, they all omit without a cause. Making Jesus Christ a sinner. Or, you don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 2, of course, there's a story where he flips over the, the money changers' tables and dumps out the money and makes a whip and he drives them out of the temple and he says, you know, you've made the, you know, the God's house a, a den of thieves. I, I, I would imagine that he was probably a little bit angry when he did that. You'd have a hard time convincing me that Jesus was not angry when he made a whip and started whipping people out of the temple and throwing tables over. I've never seen anyone just start flipping tables over that wasn't angry. <laughs> never happened. So these new versions, I mean, just right there demonstrates their corruption. Because within their own translation themselves, they make Jesus Christ a sinner. How can that be of God? It's not. Now, like I said, this is kind of a deep issue. There's a lot of things to consider. I'm not going to go and, and, and tackle every single possible objection or whatever. Because you can say, well, yeah, maybe those aren't perfect, but neither is the King James. That's a sermon for another day. Why, you know, the King James Bible, I do believe, is perfect. I don't believe there's any contradictions. I've actually preached other sermons tackling other supposed contradictions within the King James Bible. There aren't any. What there are is of people that lack understanding. There's a lot of people that can't hear God's Word, so they think there's all kinds of contradictions. That's why you usually find atheists and people that hate God or say, oh yeah, the Bible's just full of contradictions. And they're the ones that are the most loudly just posting this stuff online or whatever. And trying to, what they're trying to do is shake your faith. Trying to get you unsettled. Trying to, to, to scare you into thinking, oh no, I don't know, can I believe this? But we don't have to worry about that. We have a solid rock. We have a sure foundation. And the word of the Lord is sure. And God has made that promise just as much as I believe God promised to give me eternal life. And I believe that and I'm trusting in that. I believe God that he promised to preserve his word and he did. And he didn't preserve it under a rock somewhere that nobody knows about. And it's just waiting, just being preserved and, and stored away until way down the line in the future. And you could say, oh, look here, it's preserved. No. That's why it says from this generation and forever, meaning it's going to continue forward because what, what good are his words going to do if no one hears them anyways? Uh, and, and we're commanded to preach his word. We're commanded that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That is like our daily food that we should be getting. Well, how can we be living by every word, word of God if we don't have every word of God? So we're going to get into now some of these um, contradic not contradictions, but exact opposites that are found in these modern versions. I'm going to spend pretty much the rest of the time just going through these. And you're going to get the point, but it's important enough to hear this and to see it and to see how often this happens. And this is not all of them. I could go through the verses that are just completely removed in the modern translations Okay, that's a whole nother sermon, but what I'm dealing with today is the exact direct opposites. In 1 John chapter 2, and you could follow along if you'd like, 1 John, actually no, turn if you go to Exodus 26. Turn, if you, turn to Exodus 26. I'll read for you from 1 John 2, because this is the last kind of principle or point as I get into these. 
1 John 2.21 says, I have not written unto you because you know, because, excuse me, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth or from the truth. Lies don't come out of truth. Lies pervert the truth, but that you're not going to get a lie out of something that's true. So if God's word is true, you're not going to get lies out of God's word. You can only get true things, good things, right things from something that's true. Um, God's word is not found in lies. And that's, again, that's another reason why we use the King James Bible, because it is true. We're not getting any lies from this book. But that being said, which of these verses, they're all, it's all one verse, is correct? And if it's not correct, then it's a lie. Right? If, it's, if it's not accurate, if this is not the Word of God. And, and we're starting here in Exodus 26. You can read it, verse number 14, in the King James Version. The King James says, And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram's skins dyed red, and a covering above of badger's skins. Now you say, Pastor Versions, what does this even matter? Who cares about this tabernacle and what, you know, ram skins, badger skins? What does that have to do with me? Well, first of all, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for... for it's profitable for us today, okay? Not just the Old Testament, but not just that. This is God's Word, you know explaining how the tabernacle is supposed to be made in the Old Testament, and God is very specific about how it was supposed to be created. And there's very good reason for that. Now, you may not have to understand what all the reasons are, but if God is, is, is making explicit statements, we should at least respect God enough to say, hey, if God wants it this way, then this is important. And one thing you'll notice, especially as you learn, you come to church more, you study on your own more, you study the Bible more, you'll see a lot more symbolism, a lot more truth in the Old Testament and in God's teachings, um, as, you know, even with things that may seem boring your first time going through it, or your second time, or your third time, or your fourth time, you start going through this stuff, it might seem a little boring reading, but the more you read and study, the more you're going to learn from it. I promise you, it's there. The teaching is there. It's there for a reason and is profitable for us. The King James says in, this, in Exodus 26, 14, it's talking about the covering of ram skins dyed red. Now, being dyed red should have a probably obvious symbolism, right? Dyed red to, to show the blood. Okay, the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it says, and a covering above of badger skins. Now, the New American Standard says, you, sh you shall make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red. Okay, so that's the same. That lines up. And a covering of porpoise skins above. So a badger and a porpoise, for those of you who don't know, they're different animals. It's not the same skin that you're going to be putting on the tabernacle. Right? So that says porpoise skins. The ESV says, and you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins. It doesn't say dyed red, it's just tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. So it's not badger skins on top, it's goat skins. The ISV, the International Standard Version, says, Ye are to make a cover for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering of dolphin skins above that. Now, I don't know where they were getting the dolphin skins when they were in the wilderness, you know, when they, when they came out of Egypt. But I guess if God said it, they need to go out and find some dolphin skins. <laughs> the NIV says, Make for the tent a covering of ram skins dyed red, and over that, a covering of the other durable leather. Whichever one that is, just the other one. Just get the other durable leather. Now, they all say something different. Every single one is different from the other. Which one is right? I was preaching in a recovery home. We had this ministry in Prescott Valley that that because I, I was trying to find something else to do, just try to do some more work, find another ministry to be a part of. 
and they were helping women who were, you know, had found themselves in a bad situation, but they're trying to do what's right. It was a good ministry in the sense that it's trying to help out people who, they're not drug addicts or anything like that, at least not anymore. They, maybe they got themselves into trouble, but they're trying to go the right way. So they would hold, you know, they, had, they, they were required to attend church services. They were, you know, there's all these different things. They had a zero tolerance policy and everything else. They're trying to help them get back on their feet. And, you know, we got this opportunity. I went there and I talked to them and said, hey, man, can we, you know, we'd like to do chapel. So they let us come in, do chapel. I think it was about two or three weeks and we were kicked out. And the reason why I was kicked out was because of this teaching right here. Because what did I do there? It's the same thing I'm doing here. I had a group of people. I'm saying, you know what? What are the most important things? What are some of the core doctrines? I taught on salvation by grace through faith the very first time I was there. And then I taught on, I forget what the other subject was. Um, the second time, it's failing me right now. And then I preached on the Bible versions. Why? Because it's important. I mean, if you're a believer and you want to read and understand from God's Word, you need God's Word. You don't want a bunch of lies. Read what's right. Don't get a bunch of junk in your head. Don't be reading about dolphin skins. You know, read about what, the, what God's Word actually says. And you said, he says, well, this is actually going to shake their faith. Because you're telling, you know, no, it's actually not supposed to shake their faith. It's actually designed to point out errors so they don't go down the wrong path. They don't read a bunch of lies and then figure it out later on. Wow, I've wasted all this time in a book that's not God's Word. I'm trying to help them out. Even the, the Septuagint, and I'm not going to get too much into that. I, I don't have any other verses uh, from the Septuagint, but if you don't know what the, the Greek Septuagint is, um, supposedly the Greek version of the, of the Old Testament. But again, that's not, that, and, and people will claim, oh, that's what Jesus used and everything else. It's not. It's full of errors. The Greek Septuagint says, in English, and thou shalt make for a covering of the tabernacle ramskin side red and blue skins as coverings above. So again, something even more different. Maybe that's where they get the dolphin skins from, thinking that they're blue or something. I don't know. That all looks very confusing to me. And for someone, for anyone, new believer, anyone that wants to just, just read their Bible, this is all very confusing. They all say something different. What am I supposed to do? I've heard some people say, well, I just read them all and then just kind of get the meaning from them. Well, that's silly. Why would you want to read 10 lies and one thing that's the truth to just get a better understanding? How about we just get rid of all the lies and just read that which is true? We don't need to read all the different ones and then just pick and, and you know, it's also not a smorgasbord. We don't just pick and choose which one you like the best. What we care about is what's right and what's true. It doesn't matter what you like or what you prefer, what sounds better. You say, well, I like dolphins. I think dolphin skins would look really good. It doesn't matter. What matters is what God said. With all of these different versions saying something different and being that confusing, we know right off the bat that they cannot all be from God. They cannot be. The Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God is not the author. God doesn't want you confused. God isn't just sending all these different Bible. Oh, this is for kids to understand, and this is for women to understand, and this is for men to understand, and they all say something different. I'm sorry, that's confusion. You know, God actually does want unity in the church. I hear a lot of people today go out soul winning and say, oh, why are there all these different denominations? And you complain about this. Complain. You know, why, why can't we all just come together? Well, you know what? God would really love for everyone to come together too. In the unity of the faith. But he's not for compromising the truth. He's just saying, hey, I would that, God would that everybody used his actual words and not some lie and not some other book. And you know what? As a church, when I say we're King James only, you may say, yeah, that's very divisive. And it can be. Sure. But we're trying to bring unity, though, within the church and say, look, we're all using the same Bible. I've been in a church where, where people had different versions of the Bible. And we kind of sat around, well, my Bible says this and my Bible says that. That's confusing. That's not very much unity. Because then the guy that has this Bible says, well, I like this Bible. I, I, I believe this. And you got people believe in different things. Because their book says something different. No, we're gonna, our source is all going to be the same here. We're using one Bible. 
And, and it's, it just so happens to be the truth. Now, as I mentioned before, there's many ways to prove the KJV to be the pure word of God. And um, one way is just by doing a simple comparison, which is what we're doing. Um, and we're, of course, there's no way we're going to look at all the different versions. There's like over 400 of them in English language. But we're looking at what's been the most accepted. What the most people are looking to when they go out to buy Bibles. Now, they may be accepted because they've been the most promoted or they're making the most money, but it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever people are going to accept, that's what we're doing the most comparison with. Now, in this comparison, they're not just minor differences or a preference on which word to deal with as if they're like synonyms. It's, it's exact opposites. Because you will find, and I'll tell you this right now, you will find verses that will say almost the same thing. You look at it and be like, well, I don't see what the big deal is. And some people will do that, and, and, they'll, and they'll start looking through and say, well, I don't see what the big deal is, because you read a couple verses, you say, well, it's basically the same thing, just a just little bit different, but not that big of a deal. And you'll find that a lot, but that's why I pull out all of these different verses to show you that it's not just that. And that if you just look at one or two verses and say, oh, well, it's basically the same thing, then you're going to start running into these other things that you didn't check out for yourself. Turn if you go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. What's also really interesting about these, these verses and passages I'm going to be bringing up today is that the vast majority of them are coming from the Old Testament. Now, there is very significant differences in the New Testament, and there's different Greek manuscripts that, that the modern versions use, the Westcott and Hort and again, I'm not going to get into all the technical details on the manuscripts and stuff. That's another way to look up this issue and understand why the King James Version is the true version and why it's right. When you just look up the source, the manuscript sources that they use to translate from, they're actually different. The source texts that are used to do the translation from, it's not just people looking at the same exact sentence in Greek and then coming up with a different translation. It's their source is different. It makes them completely... And that's also why the, the modern versions will all almost say the same thing. Almost all the time. Because their source is the same. Versus the King James Version. It's a different source altogether. But there's a lot of difference in the New Testament. Again, I'm not going to be focusing on that today. The Old Testament, though, you'd think, well, that's much more settled and established. Because... I mean, how many different versions of Hebrew are there out there? You know, the Old Testament was a lot older and had been accepted for a lot longer throughout history. Yet, why is it that we're still going to find direct opposites? And that's important because it's not just a simple mistake. It's actually an attack on God's Word. Isaiah chapter 9, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Very easy to understand. What's he saying? Zebulun and Naphtali, in the beginning, at first, it says they were lightly afflicted. Right? So they're afflicted, but it, it was a lightly. And then it got more severe. He says, afterward, it got more grievous. Right? It got a lot worse. Well, what does the ESV say? The ESV says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So in the King James, it says, afterward, he did more grievously afflict. And in the ESV, he says, in a lifetime, he's made it glorious. Exact opposites. Totally different. Not saying the same thing whatsoever. Way different one from the other. Keep reading there, verse number two. It says, The people that walked in darkness have not seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them at the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, verse three, and not increased the joy. 
They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Well, guess what verse number 3 says in the ESV? It says, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. That one little word, not, has been omitted. Oh, it's just one word difference. Who cares, right? Oh, yeah, except it means the exact opposite when you remove the word not from a sentence. This is, this is very important. And that's, that's the ESV. This is the version that, that the scholars tend to use. Isn't this the, the preferred version of James White? Yeah, isn't, isn't that his version? The ESV is the scholarly version. You, and, and we could go in, again, there's entire sermons that preach on every single one of these versions because it's not scholarly, it's, it's idiotic. It really is. And at the very least, when you see this stuff, you have to say, well, you know what, I have to make a decision. What's true? What's right? Um, Genesis, turn if you go to Genesis 27. We'll see another comparison of the King James Version with the ESV. Genesis 27, verse number 39. The Bible reads, And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. The ESV reads, and you can follow along in your King James and spot the difference. Verse number 39 from the ESV. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. So notice in verse 39, it says, instead of saying your dwelling is going to be the fatness of the earth, he says, away from the fatness of the earth. It's the exact opposite. And then in verse number 40, he says, when thou shalt have the dominion, meaning he's going to become in power, he's going to be in charge over his brother, he says, when you just grow restless. You just get kind of antsy. It's a little bit different than the dominion. Uh, turn if you would to 2 Kings 23. If you want to follow along with these, 2 Kings 23. We're going to look at verse number 29. 2 Kings 23, verse number 29, the Bible reads, In his days Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him, and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. The NIV reads, While Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. Did he go up against the king of Assyria, or did he go up to help the king of Assyria? And then it says, King Josiah marched out to meet him in battle, but Necho faced him and killed him at Megiddo. Now, this is important, and, and, it's, and it's very serious when they start um, doing the interpretation automatically. When you go back to the language, it uses the, the, the pronoun he. It doesn't use the name, Pharaoh Nico, but what the NIV does is they just insert the name and do the interpreting for you and just saying the he must be referring to Pharaoh Nico. And look, regardless of if that's right or wrong, when you start doing that, you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're making the interpretation already and then doing the, and, and providing that as your translation instead of, instead of just basically providing the text that's given. And that's going to open you up to a lot more error. And those are the types of, a lot of the errors that you're going to find in the modern translations is that they do interpretations and then give you that translation of the way they interpret God's word to be instead of just saying, well, this is what it says. 
I just want to know what God's word says. I don't need your interpretation added in there for me to help me understand it better. Just give me what God's word actually says. Now the New King James, the New King James Version, so, and this is important to point out too, because a lot of people get deceived into thinking that, well, the New King James, it's just like the King James Version, it's just without the these and the thous, and it makes it a lot more easy to understand. No, it's not. No, it's not. Now it has less perversions than some of the other modern versions. It lines up more, just more frequently with the King James in general. But the times where it's different, almost every single time it matches up perfectly with all these modern translations. And again, from different sources. And even in this situation here, verse number 29, in the New King James, it says, In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him. And Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. You notice how that's basically the same thing as the NIV but very, very different from the King James. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 7. I'll read for you from Job 16. You should have to turn everything. Job 16, 20 says, My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. The NIV says, My intercessor is my friend, as my eyes pour out tears to God. So instead of my friends scorning me, my friend, you know, my friends, who are supposed to be my friends, they're scorning me, then Abby just says, well, my intercessor is my friend. There's no scorning going on whatsoever in Job 16, 20. Psalm 7, look at verse number 4. The Bible reads, If I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. Okay, then the verse continues on. But what's he saying here in verse number 4? He says, He's trying to say, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, saying, you know, like if, if I did wrong to someone else, and they didn't have any problem with me, but I just one did wrong to him. Because in this psalm, he's going he's to say, you know, well, well, then bring my judgment on me. Right? But then he says, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. So as he's, he's, he's making his statement, like, look, if I've done wrong to someone else, they were at peace with me, he says, Actually, in parentheses, I have actually done good to those that were doing wrong to me. I've delivered them that were my enemies that had no reason to be enemies with me. So he's saying the flip side, I've done what's right. The, all the modern versions, the New King James, the ESV, the NIV, the New American Standard, the Holman version, they all line up basically saying the same thing and their, their books say if I have repaid evil to him who is at peace with me or have plundered my enemy without cause basically he's, they're restating the same statement instead of that parenthetical statement saying look I've actually delivered those that, that did wrong to me and completely changed the meaning of what that verse is saying and the righteousness of David there is just, is just eliminated. Turn if you go to Psalm 10, verses number 4 and 5. Verse number 4, the Bible reads, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight, as for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. Now, that makes sense. The wicked, talking about the wicked, in, uh, in verse number four, and then continuing on in verse number five, he says, his ways are always grievous. What? The wicked's ways are always grievous. Well, in the NIV, verse four, again, it, all of them, they'll refer to the wicked in verse number four, but in five, it says, his ways are always prosperous. The New King James says his ways are always prospering. The ESV and the New American Standard say his ways prosper at all times. So instead of his ways being grievous, it's just saying, well, he's very prosperous. The wicked are prosperous. Two different things. Proverbs 18, 24. Now, look, I know we're going through this, and, and just bear with me, but it, it, it bears to mention, and I thought about this while I was preparing. I said, you know what? This may feel like it's getting a little bit old, but it needs to be gone through just to show you how serious this is and how many times it occurs. Time after time after time after time after time, we're going to see this. I'm going to try to go as quick as I can. Proverbs 18, 24. The Bible says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I love this verse. I preach on this verse multiple times. 
It says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. If you've got friends, and you need to be a friend to your friend. You know, not just, not just a friend that you use, not a friend that's there for convenience. You need to show yourself friendly to your friends. And then it says, and there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So is, having friends is a great thing. And you want to make sure you have good friends and a friend that's going to stick there closer than a brother and that you can be that good friend and be friendly and be there closer than a brother to someone else. These new perversions change it. The New American Standard says, a man of too many friends comes to a ruin. How in the world do you get that? Like, like how could you even be looking at anything close to the same thing in a translation to come up with things so vastly different? A man of too many friends comes to a ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The ESV says, a man of many companions may come to ruin. Why? Where's the wisdom in that? A man of many friends? Oh, you just, you might come to ruin. Watch out if you have many friends, because you might just come to ruin, according to the wisdom of the ESV. But there is a friend who sticks closer. See, they got the second part right. I don't know what they were doing when they got the first half of the verse. The NIV says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, at least that one makes more sense, because it's saying unreliable friends. But it's not saying anything about if you need to show yourself friendly if you have friends. Not even close. Totally different thing. Says so butcher, and what a great verse that is. What 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 a great wisdom in Proverbs that we receive from that. But all these other ones, and you know what? I bet you, and I didn't look this up, but I would bet that the NIV, they would probably render it the same way as the ESV. But they said this doesn't make sense, so they're going to add their own sense to it by saying, "Well, one who has unreliable friends." Because, that, because everything else doesn't make sense what we've seen before. So they decided to insert their own understanding to it and just try to have it make some type of sense that's not in, the, in their translation at all. Like it's not in the, the original language at all. Because that's the way that they translate. Proverbs 25. Again, an another, one, another one of my favorite verses. I love this verse too. Proverbs 25, verse number 23. Bible reads, the north wind driveth away rain. So what's it saying? You have, you have rain coming, and then you've got a north wind, and what does it do? It drives the rain away. Right? Simple concept. The Proverbs has a, lot, has a lot of simple concepts that help us understand great truths. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So what is that teaching us? If someone comes to you and starts backbiting, talking smack about other people and just and just spreading rumors, gossiping, backbiting about someone else. Do you know how you deal with that? You give them an angry look. I don't have anything to do with your backbiting. And the way that that angry countenance, the same way that the, the wind drives away the rain, saying you're going to drive away that backbiting tongue. That's what's being taught there. And you know what? That's really good advice. This is great advice to help a church from splitting, from people getting really upset with one another because if you are complicit when someone comes around and starts backbiting in church and you just listen to it all and you just pretend like it's all okay, even if you don't like it, you just sit there and you just accept it all, you're going to allow that to continue to spread and cause more damage within the church, which is why you need to give them a nasty look and show your discontent and disapproval and that you're not going to be participant in their backbiting and stop it right there and drive it away and stop it from spreading. Very important teaching. Well, let's see what this says in the New American Standard. New American Standard says, the north wind brings forth rain. It doesn't drive it away. It brings forth rain. A backbiting tongue and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. So basically it's saying that as the north wind brings rain, a backbiting tongue brings an angry look. It's not teaching the same thing at all. The ESV says the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue angry looks. The New King James, the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. The NIV, like a north wind that brings unexpected rain is a sly tongue which provokes a horrified look. 
The NIV takes a lot of liberties, if you haven't noticed that already. And the other ones are, are very similar to each other, but the NIV just go ahead and just, just adds unexpected, and it's a sly tongue, not backbiting, but just, it's just kind of sly. They're just a little tricky. And it provokes a horrified look. <gasps> I mean, it's different. Again, a horrified is different than angry. It's, just, it's not the same. What is God trying to say? He did, I'll tell you what, he didn't say these other things. His word, what Solomon wrote, is found in the King James Bible. Look at Proverbs 26, verse number 22. The words of a talebearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. And isn't that the truth? People who tell stories and tell lies and just spread rumors, they're like wounds. You're hurting the individual that you're speaking about. They're like wounds. But what do the new versions say? The New American Standard, the words of a whisper are like dainty morsels. Well, dainty morsels sound pretty good. I'm a little hungry right now. I'd like to have a couple dainty morsels. The words of a whisper are like dainty morsels and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Like, oh, it's a good thing. Let's, let's, let's have a whisper come in so I can have some dainty morsels and just go into my belly and I'll feel satisfied. The ESV says the words of a whisper are like delicious morsels. That sounds good, too. They go down in the innermost parts of the, of the body. The new King James, right? The one that only changes the these and the thous. The words of a tail bearer are like tasty trifles. And they go down into the inmost body. The NIV, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. Choice. They go down to the inmost parts. <coughs> That's not wisdom. Gossip is not a good thing. They're wounds. It's hurtful. It's not something good. It's not something pleasant. It destroys. It hurts. It damages. Where is the warning in these other versions? It's not there. They say the opposite thing. Ecclesiastes 2, if you want to turn there, because we're kind of going forward through the Bible. We're almost, almost done. Ecclesiastes 2, verse number 8. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. If you haven't heard this, this one before in other versions, you just wait. If you thought some of the other ones were ridiculous, you'd be wondering where in the world are they getting this from? Ecclesiastes 2 makes sense. Ecclesiastes, again, is from the preacher. Who is that? Solomon. Now, who introduced a, a, a vast array of musical instruments into the service of the Lord? It was King David, right? He's the one who really had this heart for music and kind of introduced a lot more musical stuff. Why? Well, at first you had the service of the Lord being in the tabernacle with the Levites doing that service. And then David wanted to build God a house, right? And God said, well, I didn't command to be in a house. I don't need a house. The tabernacle is what I wanted you to have. But you know what? It's fine that it came into your heart. It's okay. You know, he said, well, Solomon's going to build it, not you. And when they finally created the temple, well, the job of the Levites now that had these different jobs as far as the tabernacle is concerned, they don't need to do that stuff anymore because there's a stationary place in the temple. And David loved music and he incorporated that in the, the worship of the Lord that now they have a bunch of uh, um, men singers and women singers, and they had you know, a lot more musical uh, um, talents, a lot more musical ability, being music being performed in here. And Solomon's saying, you know what? As king, I got silver, I got gold, I got peculiar treasures. I got me men singers and wingers. So this is unto himself. He says, I got me singers and delights of the sons of men. He's, he's talking about his riches and he says, as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So what do you get? All sorts of musical instruments. All different kinds. He loved music. He got all kinds of musical instruments. Well, the New American Standard in this verse says, Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Now, we know that King Solomon had many concubines. That, that is true that he did that. But this verse 
in the King James Bible says he got a lot of musical instruments, and in New American Standards, he says he got many concubines. Don't worry, it's going to get a little bit weirder. Wait, as we continue on. That's actually the most tame in the New American Standard, saying that he got a bunch of concubines. ESV says, I also gathered for myself silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Like, the concubines are just this delight of the sons of man. Verse number 8 in the NIV, and you're going to love this one. I amassed silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well. The delights of a man's heart. You got a harem. How do you get harem from musical instruments? Concubines. It's bizarre. It's not the same thing. It's not the same source. It's not the same book at all. There's not just slight differences. Um, Ecclesiastes 8.10, Baba reads, And so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. In the NIV and the, e in the ESV, it says, instead of saying they were forgotten in the city, it says they received praised, praise or were praised. They weren't forgotten, they were actually praised. Exact opposite. Um, turn, if you would, to Hosea. Hosea chapter 10. I'm going to read Jeremiah 51 for you. Jeremiah 51, 3 says, Against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifteth himself up in his brigandine, and spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her host. <coughs> Instead of let the archer bend his bow, the New American Standard says, let not him who bends his bow bend it. ESV says, let not the archer bend his bow. The NIV says, let not the archer string his bow, nor let him put on his armor. Again, the exact same opposite. And that was Jeremiah 51. Hosea 10, verse number 1. The Bible says, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. The ESV and the New American Standard says, Israel is a luxuriant vine. So which one is that? Are you luxuriant or empty? The NIV says, Israel was a spreading vine. Again, exact opposites. Hosea 11, verse number 12. Some of these you might look at and say, like, well, I still don't see that big of a deal. Well, look at Hosea eleven twelve. 12. Ephraim compasseth me, compasseth me about with lies in the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. So you know that the, the whole nation of Israel is split up into two nations. You have Israel and Judah. And as you read through the books of the Kings and Chronicles, you'll see that, that by and large, the southern kingdom of Judah was way more righteous and holy in general. That's where they still served the Lord. That's where the priests and the Levites were. And that was kind of the lighthouse through the ages of, uh, uh, after the kingdom was split. And the, kingdom, the nation of Israel was, was much more wicked. And they went after idols. And they did all kinds of other things. Well... This verse in Hosea 11, 12 is basically saying, you know, Ephraim is just full of lies, the house of Israel is just full of deceit, but, hey, Judah still rules with God, and they're faithful with the saints. That's giving credit to Judah. Well, the New American Standard says, Ephraim surrounds me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is also unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is faithful. The NIV says, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, Israel with deceit, and Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful one. The exact opposite. Now, you, you get doctrines like this, you can find out when was Hosea written, what was going on in Judah, and say, well, Hosea was given witness that Judah's being unruly when they're doing righteous things. Because it matches up in the King James Version when it says Judah yet rules with God and they're doing right things. Well, now you can take, you can come up with doctrines where you're going to find out, well, what was going on during the time of Hosea and start saying whatever Judah was doing was wicked because, well, it says here Judah is unruly against God as opposed to being righteous and good. See, Hosea confirms what Judah did as being righteous, whereas the new, the new versions will, uh, will condemn it and cause contradictions. 
New Testament. All right, I'm almost done. This is the last place I'll be turning is the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. <coughs> Colossians chapter 2, verse number 18. The Bible says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The, new, the NIV says, um, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. So, which one is it? Have they seen it or have they not seen it? Colossians 4. Look at Colossians 4. It's the last verse. Colossians 4, verse number 8. The Bible says, Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. The ESV and the, and the New American Standard and NIV all say the same thing. It says, I have sent him to you for this purpose, for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So instead of him knowing how they're doing, it says that you might know how we're doing. It's the exact opposite. Okay, you, you have contradictions. Like, like I said, I went through quite a bit because you know, I, I went a little bit over time than what I was planning on. But there's, I mean, there's a lot of pages of notes here. This is by no means all of them. This is done just to show you that there are some very significant differences. They say the exact opposite things. And you have to come to a decision and say, well, well, which one is right? Which one is true? Do we have to pick and choose every single time you come across a contradiction between all the various versions that are out there and just decide, well, this one's right here and that one's right here and that one's right there? Do you think that God has made it that difficult for us to receive his word that we have to get all these different translations? And then this year when a new one comes out, and next year when the next new one comes out, we have to continue just getting all these versions and say, well, I don't know. No, maybe the truth's in this one. Maybe the truth is coming out in 2020. I don't know. No, it's been around for a long time. That's why we use the old King James Version. It's been around for over 400 years. It's been accepted and tried and true. And you can see the fruits of this book just when this was the only, the only used and accepted Bible how much, what happened to the morality? What happened to evangelism? Look at the works that have been done in the past 400 years. By and large, we didn't have the NIV. We didn't have the ESV. We didn't have the New American Standard. Yet, we saw lots of progress according to God, in God's Word. We saw a lot of righteousness. I mean, even going back to the foundation of this country, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a perfect country and this has always been just, just super awesome and they had everything right, but they had biblical principles. The laws, and you go back and look at what was on the law books, going back to the foundation, especially with the colonies, before the United States of America became the United States, you look at the laws that were here in the colonies, and you're going to find way more coinciding with this book than probably we've ever seen since, like, Israel. And, and being and accepting God's judgment and what God ordained as, as righteous judgments for crimes, way different. And you know what they had to use? The King, it was called the Holy Bible, or maybe the authorized version of the Bible. It's authorized by King James. Like I said, you know. If this one point, because it's really just one point that I'm making today on, on the Bible versions, does it convince you? There's about 10 others easily that I can make that just give you more evidence on why we believe the King James Version. If this is the first time you're hearing about it, I suggest that you look into it a little bit more. You could find all kinds of information. I'll, I mean, go look online or come talk to me later. I'll give you all kinds of, of, of extra info that you can get on this subject to hopefully settle you that this is the Word of God. We can trust every word in this book and know that it's true. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for providing your words for us today and that um, just as much as we can trust Jesus Christ for our salvation, we can trust the words that state such a thing, Lord, and that, and that you've promised to preserve them. We believe that you have, dear Lord. I pray that you please just um, bless everyone here today. I pray that you please help us to uh, bring your words effectively to, a, to the loss that we're going to go um, reach this afternoon. I pray that you please just be with us. Help us to see many souls saved. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.